Um, my, name, my name is Brandon Smith. I'm a PGY3 PM&R resident at Mayo Clinic, and I'll be serving as a moderator. Um, Dr. Magda Inesqua um, is the program director at the University of Chicago. Dr. Jonathan Gorey is the program director at the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences. Dr. Susan Moshler is a program director at uh, Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. And lastly, Dr. Karan Patel is a program director at Northwell Spine and Pain New York Pain Fellowship. I also wanted to thank uh, Dr. Ryan D'Souza, who's a pain medicine physician at Rochester Mayo and Anand's RFS co-chair for helping coordinate and accumulate the audience questions. And also lastly, a thanks to Sam Farah and Amy Kepper for helping organize this webinar. So uh, to get things started, I have a list of questions as the audience begins to send in um, their questions. And Dr. Moshe, perhaps you can answer this question first. Um, so many applicants are trying to build experience with research, pain rotations, letters of recs. Um, but I was curious, in your opinion, you know, what are the top factors that make a, a strong pain fellow applicant? Yeah, great. Thank you. And thanks for uh, hosting this great program tonight. So I think you know, I, I, when I talk to residents interested in pain medicine, I certainly first talk about just making sure that you're doing a great job um, in your clinical care in the core residency program in which you're a part, um, first and foremost, because certainly um, one, that's the right thing to do to take care of our patients. And then of course, you are going to get letters from your program director. From then, um, getting any experience that you can, um, whether it's doing a pain rotation um, is great and to get more experience and potentially a letter of recommendation. Some locations I recognize don't have pain medicine electives or an opportunity. So in that case, getting involved with a society such as NANS in the resident uh, section and meeting, you know, colleagues at your training, fellows, other faculty from other institutions, these are great ways to reach out and make some connections. Awesome. Dr. Murray, anything to add to that? You know, I, I think the, I, I, I agree with everything that Dr. Mosler said. Um, and those are the things we look for in our fellowship, I would say. Uh, the main thing we look for is just curiosity. Um, someone who's really curious and someone who takes patient care, you know, to the nth degree. And a lot of that, as Dr. Moster says, comes from delivering good patient care during your primary specialty uh, residency. Um, and then we see that kind of in your letters. But then also someone who just wants patients to be better and is willing to ask the right questions to get there. Uh, whether those are questions of patients, whether those are questions of us, of the faculty members, of people around the country, or other questions that lead to, you know, the next discovery in our field. And so that's what's most important to me. Thank you. Dr. Inesco, um, we're just asking, you know, the program directors kind of top of their opinions on what makes a strong pain fellow applicant. Yep. Um, yeah, thank you. I, I got there. I, sorry, I was um, um, having problems with the, with the Zoom, so I joined a little bit late. So for us, it's basically team player and the ability to multitask. So pain medicine is just, uh, you know, it's very complex um, uh, specialty. Uh, sometimes you have to do multiple things in the same time. So the ability to multitask and the ability of just being present and engaged with the um, your patients and your program and um you know, your education, that's pretty much what makes a um, good candidate for us. Awesome. Thank you. Um, we'll go on to the next question. Just as a reminder to the audience, um, you can go into the Q&A feature now and type in your questions. That'll be sent to us to the panelists, and we'll start accumulating those questions. Um, Dr. Gurry, I was hoping you could answer the next question. I know many applicants have a question of, you know, for a lot of times it's November or December and we, we hit submit on our application, but between then and interview, there may be some updates on our application, whether we had new research involvement, new committee involvement, you know, things like that. I was wondering of kind of your opinion and everyone's opinion regarding communication after hitting submit on our application, if, if that's a preference and how to go about that process. Yeah, I would say for, for our program, the best way to interact with us is through our program coordinator. And so if you have updates to your application, then I would say, go ahead and send them to us. And as we're looking through applications, as we're considering, we definitely will take them into consideration. And Dr. Moshe, anything to add to that? I echo that engaging with our uh, program coordinators, just because we get a lot of um, communications and updates. 
And uh, I can speak for my program that we, our education coordinator, keeps a running, we have a big Excel file in addition to uh, the, you know, errors process in which we make notations on things when people send a updated that they were elected chief, you know, resident or they presented at a conference um, and such. Awesome. Uh, Dr. Patel, we were just kind of wondering what everyone's opinion was. Maybe you could speak to your kind of preferences on communications after hitting submit on our, our pain fellowship applications. Yeah, no, I definitely appreciate receiving updates, you know, when things have changed, when, you know, somebody has done well on an in-service or presented or published something. Um, so I think emailing emailing the contacts on ERS are really your, your best bet, um, particularly for our program. That's what I prefer. Dr. Ernesco, anything to add? No, we do receive several uh, uh, emails, communications. So the best way to do is just, um, as uh, everybody su suggested, the, um, um, the coordinators for uh, the program. Um, you know, you would I would advise everyone to kind of really just contact the program if you're really interested in the program, because, you know, otherwise it'd be, um, um, you know, it's becoming too much. So if you're interested in the program, I would really recommend to uh, to reach out to the coordinators and maybe program director if the coordinator is not responsive, but usually they're very, very good and very responsive. Uh, but if you're not interested in just um, apply widely and just like, you know, it's just another program that would be usually a waste of time for both sides. So just like, please, please um, just reach out only if you're interested in the program particularly. Awesome. Thank you for your input. Yeah, we'll go on to the next question here from the audience. Um, someone has a question. It says, um, you know, if a candidate has a low ITE score or SAE score, kind of the, the standardized exam score, but otherwise has a strong application, um, how much of those scores weigh into their total application? Would you still consider them for an interview? Um, Dr. Patel, maybe you can start with this question. Sure. You know, I, I think scores are important. I don't think they're everything. Um, I think if somebody has a did particularly poorly in, in on one test and, you know, there was a lot of life circumstances going on, I think it warrants a conversation. I certainly sometimes bring it up during the interview uh, so I can find out more about the person that, you know, a paper application may not tell me. Uh, so I do think that scores are important. Um, as like a general trend, but if there's something that's outlier, like an outlier, uh, if there's a personal life experience and reason to explain, you know, maybe why you didn't perform well on something, um, I, I think it's reasonable. So it's all within context. And then I'll just open up to the other panelists. Does anyone else have any other opinions? <laughs> So a while back, I think we discussed through the uh, APPD meeting, uh, maybe five, six years ago, maybe you guys remember that we discussed that the IT scores are primarily a way for the um, applicants to improve themselves. So um, for us, we stopped looking at the ITs uh, probably about four or five years ago. So yes, we do have a USMLE scores. I think there's another question about USMLE scores. We don't have a cutoff, but for ITE exams, I don't, you know, we don't necessarily look at them. Many applicants do share them with us, but we do not specifically request them for that particular reason that, you know, Dr. Patel just mentioned. I mean, you know, score is a is a is a one number in time. So it's just not necessarily um, applicable to the whole you know, um, applicant as well. So it might be other reasons for the, where they scored low or they missed one or two um, uh, exams. So you know, it's a lifetime of learning. It's not necessarily just only one time in one moment in time, so. I'll comment briefly here. Um, I feel like over the last eight years, I've given less emphasis to scores. I have no cutoff um, for uh, steps or for ITE. Um, I think we tried to take more of a double AMC um, approach to the holistic review of candidates. And really, um, because scores are not predictive of performance necessarily in fellowship or um, in clinical practice. And so experience, you know, attributes um, and, and how those are, you know, conveyed in letters and personal statements about, um, you know, previous work, previous, um, you know, where, where you brought up, were brought up in your life experiences um, 
and what other things have you been interested in? And, um, you know, maybe it is research, but maybe it's not. And so trying to uh, have a different, more holistic approach. Um, and we're moving towards where we're not going to have the, the USL is pretty soon. So um, I think, you know, we have, um, I at least in my program, we've shifted um, and have um, a different approach right now. And um, and so that does take longer to review applications um, because we don't use a cutoff at all. Um, and so, you know, I'm still going through applications right now. Um, and so, you know, but I think that that for us is important to not just look at a score. In a few years, like um, we talked about the ITEs in the past, they weren't meant for that, but um, we may use signaling or something. But for now, you know, comprehensive review, I think is really important. I agree with all that was said. Um, don't have much to add other than um, we don't have score cutoffs, but I agree with that point that Dr. Moshler made. And I remember being in an applicant's shoes and thinking that the process of review takes a long time. But uh, if we don't have, if we're not using score cutoffs and we're looking at applications holistically, it can take a little bit of time. So um, if you haven't gotten interview invites yet, uh, from certain programs, then um, that probably means they're going through and reading all the letters and reading all of the personal statements and doing a real holistic review of applications. So it's a good thing. So I, I would like to kind of uh, piggyback into this just uh, for applicants. So, you know, we have four positions, we received about 250 applications. So that takes a long time to review. So just like be mindful and just bear with us in the process. Right, guys? Agree? <laughs> Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, we'll go on to the next question. Um, so this question kind of going off of, you know, communication with programs again, um, many of us have a strong, um, you know, particular interest in particular programs. Um, and so someone has a question about the importance of a letter of intent. Um, does it help? Do you find it helpful? Um, and does it kind of help applicants gain an interview? Um, Dr. Patel, maybe you can answer this question first. I think I think it's helpful um, if, particularly if the letter is, is is personalized, right? If it's meaningful, like if there's particular attributes of the program that the applicant is aware of and they highlight them, um, then I think it's, there is value to it. Um, oftentimes, you know, and maybe others on the panel can, can relate, you know, we get a very generic letter of intent, letter of interest rather. Um, and uh, it's not so, meaningful, if you will, because it's not anything particular to the program. Um, so that's kind of how I feel. Like I, if, if somebody really truly has awareness of the program and has some strong points that they're interested and attracted to, certainly send the email. I think it can only help um, our communication. And I'll open up to the rest of the panelists here. I agree with that. So, uh, you know, letter of interest is only important if you really are interested in the program. So as it says, letter of interest. So um, just be mindful for everyone's, um, um, you know, uh, time. Just, you know, if you really are interested, just like make your um, wishes known. But if you're not very interested, don't. Dr. Moshe, Dr. Gree, anything in addition to add to that? I think if there's like like the others said, it, you know, if there's a a point, it, it becomes difficult as a program or a program director to know um, what is sincere and what um, you know. And I think um, so. It can be it it can be a challenge um, when we get inundated with um, you know letters, um, and so that again is why we have the the, you know, errors application process that we do. Um, you know, I think that if there's something about why you want to be, you know, at, um, in Chicago or New York or Arkansas, you know, and um, with a very meaningful um, connection and content and whatnot, I think that is worthwhile. Um, but Anything generic, you know, I, I would say just have in your personal statement about commitment to pain medicine and such. Yeah, I agree. I'll also add, 
I think that once, you know, if we move to signaling, I think that will be helpful because then we know that those letters are limited. We, you know, in the practical reasons, it's hard for us not to know that, you know, someone didn't send a letter to everybody, right? And so I think that's one of the challenges. Um, but also, to add, I think it's also helpful that if you're going to send a letter, um, as Dr. Patel said, especially now with information sessions and in-person conference interactions, if you can add a personal touch to it, I think that is helpful. Something that will either call us something in your application, tell us something about you. But if you don't have any kind of personal relationship or reason to be at that program or, or something about that program that you find interesting, then I don't think it'll help. I think it it probably would, would come off as generic. Dr. Gorey, maybe you can help answer the next question here first as well. Um, the next question someone had was talking about advice for um, applicants coming from a non-traditional residency program, so like psychiatry, emergency, neurology. Um, what kind of factors can help them become a competitive candidate for a pain fellowship? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. I think the the best thing is knowledge of the field. And so really understanding, um, having ex as much experience as possible, kind of understanding what a fellowship and a career in interventional pain looks like. That can come by doing rotations, that can come by doing research with people who are in interventional pain fields, that definitely can be conveyed by getting a letter from somebody who is a practicing interventional pain physician, especially if they're in academic medicine, because they can speak to your qualities that would make you a good pain fellowship applicant. Um, I think the other way is by attending conferences like NANS or some of the other national meetings that we have where you can get a lot of experience or a lot of, uh, a lot of understanding of what's cutting edge in our field. Awesome. And I'll open up to the, the panelists if anyone has any additional thoughts on that. Yeah, I, I'll be I'll be really honest. Um, you know, for I think for some of our non-traditional applicants, I think having somebody who will speak to you, the dexterity of your manual skills, right, and performing procedures. Um, nobody expects you to come to Pain Fellowship ready made, but you know, it's only a year. We want to work with people who. Um, are have have been exposed to pain, have had their hands in you know things a little bit, um, and so that we can take our fellows as they graduate and as they move through their training year to the next level. Um, and I think what would be good for our non-traditional applicants is if they have exposure, particularly to the interventional aspects. Um, I think that, and then then possibly letters that you know, really describe their their hands-on interventional experience. I think that will go a long way. Dr. Marshall, Ms. Glenn, anything to add to that? Um, so, Susie, you're talking? No, oh, go ahead. Okay, sorry. So um, I think I agree with um, um, my, with um, uh, Dr. Patel and Dr. Gori. So you know, if you really come from a non-traditional one, you show you have to show that you are interested in that particular specialty. So you know, if you can show that you had some uh, rotations uh, for um, you know with interventional pain specialist. Um, to kind of show that you actually have those um, uh, skills and determination to kind of move forward with a specific specialty, that would be great. Just, you know, it is one year, as Kieran said, it's just, you know, it's, you have to pack everything in one year. So um, determination, willingness to um, uh, learn, um, it's basically essential for, for everyone going into pain medicine, but specifically because the skills are, you know, we, we teach epidurals in anesthesia in first year. So, you know, you have to kind of learn those skills um, as you go in pain. So if you actually learn some of them beforehand would be a great addition um, to, um, um, to a pain fellowship, so. Dr. Marshall, anything to add for the next question? No, I think they covered it very well. Awesome, well, maybe Dr. Marshall, you can start off with the next question then. Um, someone from the audience is writing in, uh, to what extent an IMG background is considered either a red flag or deterrent for program directors? Hmm. Um, no, I think, you know, um, I don't think it's a 
red flag. Um, I think there's great opportunity for different experiences and kind of as I alluded to, you know, it, it's a little different because we're a fellowship rather than a core residency program. Um, and so, you know, most frequently, at least if it's a traditional path or people are in um, currently a residency program and then matriculating into a fellowship. Um, and there can be, you know, certainly uh, different visa types, um, but usually for uh, training, um, I'm, I'm not, I mean, we, we've, you know, we work with our uh, credentialing offices within GME for those. Um, in a non-traditional where someone might be not in a current core program or has taken, you know, a year or two off, that might be a little different. Um, but I think, again, the, the commitment to the field of interventional pain medicine, um, reasons that one is pursuing um, fellowship training at this point and how that's demonstrated um, are the important uh, factors. Awesome. Maybe Dr. Ananesquay, maybe you can um, add next. So, you know, as uh, Dr. Monchler says, it's important to uh, to realize that this is not a core residency program and it's a fellowship. So it's exactly, I mean, it you know, it will depend on what your um, scope is. If you're coming from, if you're an international graduate and matriculated in, a, in a, one of the programs, then anesthesia or PMNR or, um, or uh, neurology or psychiatry or something else, um, you know, and come to fellowship, that would be an addition and just like a continuation of what you already did. Uh, however, if you come directly from your own country to do a pain fellowship, you have to understand what do you want to do with it? Because certainly you cannot really practice in your own specialty in the United States after that. I mean, I'm an international graduate, but I went first to the anesthesia and then went to the um, to the uh, pain fellowship. I had also colleagues which had um, going through um, anesthesia subspecialties first as uh, fellows, and then they did the anesthesia residency. So that is a pathway as well, if you want to consider that one, um, if you want to practice in the United States. But you know, again, if you're coming from your own country just for the fellowship, you actually have to kind of understand what your paths are moving forward and where can you practice um, that particular the intervention pain medicine, basically. I hope it answered the question. I yeah, more confused. <laughs> yeah. Dr. Gurry, Dr. Patel, any, any additional insight? Yeah, I would say I would say it's the whole story. You know, it's somebody's whole path on what they where, where they've come from, what they want to do once they're done, and you know whether the the structure of the program can really help them meet those goals and accomplish those overall career goals and 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 in the context of their life, right? If their their goal is to you know they're from another country, they want to go back to that country, you know, or if they want to stay in the U.S. I mean just it, it the whole the whole holistic evaluation just like my colleagues here have said is so important thanks um dr and and anesco maybe we you can start off with the next question we have here um the question reads do programs consider applicant ties or regional ties uh to respect the programs like how much do you weigh geographic location of the applicant I weigh some of it. I mean, the problem is it's hard to know where they do have ties because uh, in the personal statement, it's just like, you know, there's a, I mean, in the, uh, in the applications, it's basically just the last address. So um, that is why the, uh, as we discussed before, the comprehensive review of the application, just to see if there is any, you know, relationship with, I mean, if there's any ties to the um, uh, area you know, of the program, you know, that may be um, weighing in some of it. Um, you know, some, I mean, I wouldn't say 100%, but maybe a 15, 20%, yes, it does. Um, however, people plans change, as we all know. So, you know, we might weigh in, but the applicants might not, might not weigh in the same way as the programs do. So um, it is, you know, for us, I, I do look at the, um, at the um, where the um, uh, applicants have ties, uh, regionally and just, uh, you know, um, have about 15, 20% way for that. Awesome. And Dr. Gorey, anything to add to that? No, I agree. I mean, I, I think it's one of like 
15 things we consider. I wouldn't say it's top five on the list. Um, it's something, you know, we look at, um, we look at, uh, uh, you know, one of, one of the many things we look at to kind of build a holistic applicant and really understand their story. Um, of course, you know, in order to know kind of your story, we have to know where you've been and where you've lived. And, and that's a part of it. Um, but I wouldn't say that there's applicants who we say no, because they don't have regional ties or applicants that we say yes, because they do have regional ties. And Dr. Mosher, Dr. Patel, anything to add to that? I think uh, going back to when people had asked about whether or not reaching out to a program um, is if if you have a particular desire to be in a certain region for whatever reason it is, um, family, significant other, um, you know, if you're really for for that reason, I think that geographically that is a something to bring up and a factor. Um, and at the same time, like the others have said, I have been pleasantly surprised that people are willing to come, you know, from Texas up north. Um, and at the same time, people who are from the Midwest want to go somewhere else for, you know, different things. So um, I think that it's a it's a factor, like they said, of 15. But if that if you have a particular sincere desire to be, you know, in a city or a certain region because of personal reasons, I think that's one factor. Um, to communicate to a program. So it's pretty, it's pretty easy for everyone to tell me they want to be in New York City, right? So I hear that a lot. But um, I, again, I agree with Dr. Moshler, you know, hearing a personal story of why, why, why you want to be in this area, it does, it does um, differentiate you slightly, you know, if you're truly dedicated to staying in the area for a reason other than just being in New York City. Although that's not bad either. Yeah. <laughs> Good point. Uh, Dr. Patel, maybe you can uh, start off with the next question here. Um, sure. Questions about virtual interviews. Um, how have virtual interviews changed how you evaluate applicants and um, what are some advice on how applicants can stand out during a virtual interview? I think um, <clears throat> it, virtual interviews have, have really, I think, caused a shift in um, us as program directors looking at the holistic application, having to really, really carefully read the personal statements and the evaluations and the uh, letters of recommendation, you know, all of these things, I think, really um, allow us to have a better sense of, of the applicants. And we've had to rely more on, on other sources of information because a virtual, you know, interview day is very, is very short. Um, but I think there are things that applicants can do on the virtual interview day to differentiate their presence, which is, you know, first and foremost, and it sounds silly, but to show up on time um, and then to ask questions about the program, to have learned something about the program. Um, read if there's, you know, it's, it's easy to search and find out if there's a website about the program or if speaking to somebody who's, who's graduated from the program or maybe, um, you know, if it's at an institution, maybe somebody who is, practices another specialty of medicine uh, within the institution, anything that has bearing to it, to really show an interest in the program and understanding of, of some of it. Um, I think one of the, the things that is the worst is, you know, with anything, whether it's a, a fellowship interview or a job interview or is, is somebody who has no questions because that implies that there's, there's not that much interest um, because there has to be something that they don't know about the program. So there has to be at least a few questions um, that are front of mind, particularly if you are actually interested in training there. Awesome, I'm moving on to Dr. Moshler. Dr. Moshler, any, what are your thoughts on the virtual interview ways to stand out? I think uh, simple, basic things um, that, you know, just for like Dr. Patel said, and when you're interviewing or for anything, present your best self, be on time, um, have a space that is not going to be interrupted, um, you know, so whether or not that's at home or at work or whatnot, really plan ahead so that you don't have interruptions, um, whether it be a delivery person, a, um, you know, a pet, I, I, I love I love my dog, uh, but there's, you know, a professional, so you're not distracted, you know, set yourself up, um, in a, in 
in that sort of space. Um, and then, um, you know, be just be focused and, and well prepared for the for the conversation and engaged in each um, conversation as much as you can be um, with some set questions like uh, Dr. Patel said about you know the program and then the other thing is interact with whatever opportunities there are for the trainees hopefully you know whether it's over um, a noon or before or after you know ask the fellows um, the things that you want to know I want people to come to the program that really want you know to be at the at my program and so um, make sure that you ask them everything about you know, the commute in the morning, the food in the cafeteria, um, you know, the documentation, expectations, call, all of those things. Um, everything's, you know, on the table so that you get an informed day. Um, and those are the things that normally happen or used to happen the night before or over lunch. And so um, taking advantage of those to get all your questions answered is really important. Dr. Ananasqua or Dr. Gori, any other additional insights? Um, I agree with everything was said. It's just, uh, you know, the most important thing is just like show engagement. Um, it's, you know, it's 20 minutes. It can be going very fast and very slow. It depends on how you actually are present to your interview. So come to your interview prepared and, you know, do a little bit of a homework of what the program is about. So, you know, you, you cannot really come and just ask your interviewer, where do you go to school? So it's just like simple things like this. It's just like, it makes, um, it makes perfect. I mean, just like, it may not make sense to actually ask those things beforehand. It's just, you know, do a little bit of homework and just, um, if you know who are you going to interview with, just like um, go a little bit um, uh, and research them a little bit in the program as well. So you can actually ask the pertinent questions. It will improve your chances quite significantly. Everyone on the call knows me. I can at times be a straight shooter. So I'm going to straight shoot on this one a little bit. Um, you know, the virtual interviews are kind of a two-edged sword. I mean, I think the, the benefit is, um, I think, access. So it has made interview process more equitable. Right. Like you, you don't have to pay the money to fly to a place to be able to interview. The downside is that someone can interview at 40 places um, and and sometimes people want to interview at 40 places. So they have choices. It's kind of like Baskin Robbins. Um, so I would say and, and I would say for our program, it's caused us probably to look at scores less. Because, you know, the, the the students who have those like super high scores are probably taking interviews all over the country. And while, you know, there's it's allowed us to kind of look at the holistic applicant kind of going back to how to stand out. I think there are some basic things you can do. I think one, understanding where your camera is, potentially practicing with a friend on Zoom, like getting used to using Zoom or Teams or any uh, platform if you if you're not. Uh, used to using them. Most people have had to use them over the pandemic, but if you haven't, kind of getting used to it, uh, looking into the camera when you talk, the camera is the person you're talking to's eyes. So kind of thinking about that, um, being engaged, and so not having the distractions, as was said. And then I would say, lastly, making sure you do ask, have really good questions, but make sure the questions are appropriate for who you're talking to. So if you're going to ask about like the food on campus or like do I get to get out at three o'clock on Fridays? I'm probably not the person to ask. Like you shouldn't ask the program director that. You could maybe ask a fellow or a resident that, right? But if you want to ask about kind of the, you know, specifics to the education um, of the program or kind of the foresight of the program, then the program director probably is the person to ask. So kind of think about that um, as you're asking your questions. I think we do want I, I tend to be an open book, so I want as many questions as possible, but I think it, it's also great to ask questions that are really appropriate to your talking to. Thank you, yeah, that was super helpful. Um, hopefully- I just, add, I just wanna add one more thing to that. I think, I think uh, Dr. Gorian, those are amazing points. I think also it's important to have enthusiasm. So if you're excited about a place, you know, this is your opportunity to convey that, that you're knowledgeable about the program and why you're excited about it. So, you know, go for it. Don't think that you're being too much. You know, if you're excited about a place and you really want to be there, 
you know a lot about it because you've read about it or you've heard about it, talk to people who've gone there, you know, convey that. It's really important. Well, that question was helpful for ways to stand out and things to avoid. So I appreciate that. Um, Dr. Gorey, maybe we can help answer the next question here first. Um, and probably a little bit of quicker of a question, but someone's just curious of where everyone's at regarding the interview process. Have all interview invites been sent out already from each of your prospective programs? Yeah, we have a little bit of a rolling process. So um, I kind of make make a line in the sand at one point and I send out the vast majority of our interviews. So I did that last week. Um, and then uh, in a couple of weeks, I'm going to kind of go through and review a few more um, and then potentially send out some more invites based on kind of what we have and pay, and uh, students who, you know, we've identified if we get updates, then they then we may invite interviews. So that's what kind of where we are. Our interviews are going to be in June um, and we've uh, kind of already put those two dates on our calendar. Dr. Patel. Yeah, same here. It's a it's a kind of a rolling process. Um, so we've sent some out. I've sent some out, and we're going to continue to send more out. Uh, so if there are updates, we definitely I definitely want to know about them. Um, and uh, you know, our our dates we have some in May actually, and then um, also in the beginning of June. Awesome. How about Dr. Anna Nesqua? So we um, started to uh, send invitations probably last um, week, some late last week. Uh, we continue to um, um, to send invitations for the next um, you know one or two weeks, and then we kind of um, you know we'll reevaluate and see what's going on. We have four uh, days. We have two in May, two in June, and one in August. Um, so um, you know we're just uh, filling up when you know we, we invite people and then. Um, just the first time, first um, first come, first serve. Basically, whomever responds, we can actually put them in those um, interviews. But it's a it's a, it's it's a little bit of a rolling process, but not quite. So by end of April, because we interview in May, we kind of stop you know reviewing applications, thinking that by April everyone who wanted to apply to our program would have applied. So um, you know we're very approaching the um, end of the um, reviewing process. Dr. Moshler. Yep, we have not extended any invites as of yet. I expect to do it in probably the next one to two weeks. Still, we are still going through thoroughly all the applications. Um, so I expect to extend them by the end of April, and then we are interviewing June um, 13, 14, 15. Great. Um, Moving on to our next question, uh, Dr. Ananesco, maybe you can start off here. Um, someone's asking kind of, you know, the question says, what are the three most important things that a program is looking for in an interview? And so pretty much, you know, what, what kind of things are you hoping to gather out of the interview process? So as I mentioned, it's just <clears throat> engagement is one of them. <clears throat> um, so engagement, um, really good presence um, and, um, um, you know, showing that they actually want to be in our program. Um, conversation is basically what um, needs to be happening into the, uh, into the interview. Remember, we have only 20, 25 minutes to kind of get to know you. So um, the more information you can tell us, it's the better. So um, be present, be engaged, um, uh, be honest and open. So those are the main qualities. I mean, you know, it is interventional pain medicine. It's only one year, but you know, if you have all those qualities, you will be, you know, surviving and thriving in a fellowship like ours because we teach you well. We teach you during the whole year what to do and what not to do for the um, uh, for technical aspects. But uh, you know, determination and motivation is what we're looking for um, as well in uh, in an applicant. Awesome. Man. How about Dr. Patel? What kind of factors are you hoping or things are you hoping to get out of the interview process? No, it's a year that we have to work alongside these, you know, people as well. So we want to know who you are as a person and and what your, you know, what motivates you. Um, are you somebody who, you know, is, is really genuinely interested in learning and open to um, feedback? Uh, are you passionate about neuromodulation? Are you passionate about cancer pain? Are you passionate about, you know, academics, private practice, publishing, speaking, you just want to know like who you are, you know, get, get a real sense, um, not just 
what school you train, went to, where did you train, you know, um, just how everything comes together and where you honestly see yourself going. Um, for me, that's, that's really what the fun of the interview process is. Dr. Moshe or Dr. Gore, anything in addition to add to that? Um, Dr. Moshe, maybe you can answer our next question here. Um, and it's regarding uh, communication after the interview. And so the question specifically um, regarding thank yous, um, they're expected to um, handwritten, email, kind of what thank you preferences are. And maybe you could also touch on a little bit about just expectations as far as post-interview communications in general. Sure. Um, so the um, there are very strict uh, rules through the match about uh, communication um, between programs and applicants, as I'm sure you're aware from residency match. Um, so, you know, there if if after interview day someone sends me an email, um, I may or may not you know, respond, um, and I wouldn't overread it. I've, I don't, you know, I think, um, because it, it's both ways, right? And I, I'm not allowed to ask how someone's going to rank us. Um, and I'm not going to tell, um, an applicant can tell, but there's no, they could tell 10 programs that you were going to rank someone first. And so, um, you know, and I, obviously that goes beyond just a, um, I think a, a note, an email is nice of, you know, but it's not going to necessarily impact um, rank. If you have a program you really want to, um, and that's top, you know, sending a note closer to if you, it, you know, we interview in June, um, our rank list is set a month later. Um, and so, you know, we don't necessarily input it. I don't input it right in, in July, but it is pretty set. Um, and so an email or a, a thank you note, you know, I have great intent to write a lot of thank you notes to people and I don't because life is busy. And so um, I don't want to put that on, you know, the applicants. If there's one program that you just really is at the top or you had a connection with, you know, someone during the interview cycle, um, I think that's, you know, a nice touch, but it, at least for our program, it's not going to move somebody up into a rank to match or drop down if I don't get a note. Dr. Green, anything to add to that? Yeah, I agree with what Dr. Mosler said. I would I would also add that hospital systems have terrible uh, snail mail situations most times. And so, you know, I am a big fan of writing handwritten thank you notes. I do it for a lot of things in my life. I have a little stack right here next to my desk. But um, if you're sending one, half the time, it's probably going to get lost. I can imagine at, at Mayo, the chances of me getting a handwritten thing to Dr. Mosler right now is probably pretty low. And so I would probably say if you want to send a thank you, I'd send an email. But I also agree that I don't, and I, I, I can probably speak for all of the program directors on the call and say that a thank you note or a follow-up email is not going to move you on, on a rank list. But it is a, it is a nice, kind gesture. Dr. Patel, Dr. Ananesco, any additional input on that? Or do you kind of agree? Yeah, I, I agree. Just, you know, um, if you have something nice to say, sure, say, write it, but it's not going to impact anything at all in terms of rank. I, I think it's I think it's nice to know. Um, but again, you know, like there's there's so many factors that go into things. So if you feel Again, you really want to, you know, have no regrets and don't look back at anything, you know, after the whole pain fellowship process and you want to send a, um, a thank you out, then do it. Because um, sometimes people people say, oh, well, if I had sent a thank you letter, no, it's not that. But if, if you're it's going to prevent you from having, you know, hindsight regret, then then you should do it. Awesome. Move on to the next question. Um, Dr. Gorey, maybe you can uh, start off with this question, um, more of a philosophical question that someone's asking. They're saying, you know, what do you think the future of pain medicine looks like? And how do we as applicants best prepare for the future of pain medicine? Wow, I got the, that's the hardest question we've been asked so far. <laughs> Come on, 
I can see who your favorites are. I'm just kidding. Um, no, so I, I I think the future of pain medicine is going to be more interventional. Probably the lines between uh, pain and surgery are going to blur. I think that we're headed toward the same place that interventional cardiology was 20 or 30 years ago. So I think we'll be doing more. Uh, and I think that payers and patients and the technology is going to force us to be more interventional or more kind of minimally invasive. I also think that AI is going to play a huge part in the way that we all do our jobs in the near future, as you know, some of my college student uh, nephews are already writing papers on chat GPT. So, you know, I think that's going to play a part in how we do medicine. And so how we harness that technology is going to be important. So I say that to say that, like, a big part of my practice, or there are big practice areas of my practice that I did not learn in fellowship. And I think that's going to be the same for all of you. And so, and this AI thing, I'm going to have to learn it because it's new for me. So I would say, one, as we look for applicants, we look for people who are going to be lifelong learners, um, people who are naturally curious. And I think in fellowship, your goal should be really to learn the foundations. And that's anatomy, to really understand like the, you know, understand human anatomy and how to access that anatomy if you need to. And so how to use x-ray, how to use fluoroscopy, how to use MRI, how to use ultrasound to answer the anatomical questions you have, and then understanding when it's important to access that anatomy. And so that is the clinic portion of understanding when to do a procedure, because I think that kind of outcomes and quality are also going to be a big part of our future. And so understanding that procedures need to have, I mean, one, we should care about patients to make sure outcomes are high anyway, but I think that quality piece is also going to change that kind of financial payment structure at some point. And so really making sure that you know when to do what procedure on what patient and then have the foundation to learn the procedures that are coming in five years that are going to change our field. Dr. Patel, anything to add to that? Yeah, I think, you know, I always say this to applicants and to my own fellows is that, you know, your frame, your fellowship is really a framework on how you're going to learn procedures, right? I mean, for me, for example, you know, when I was a fellow, dorsal ganglion stimulation was, was not even commercially available. There was no, you know, concept of doing that. And now it's a therapy that's changed, you know, how I practice. Um, and there's going to be therapies that don't exist right now that are going to come out during the scope of your fellowship, possibly, but certainly during the scope of your career. And so you have to focus on the basics, just like Dr. Bori mentioned. You have to understand the anatomy. You have to understand uh, the mechanism and the methods of which we deliver other pain therapies that are that are you know currently um, implemented in practice, so that as you acquire those skills, you also acquire the skills to acquire other procedures. And that's really important. Um, so building that foundation, focusing on this as your fellowship year to build that foundation that as new procedures come out, you're, you have the skill set to adapt them, whether you're still in training or whether you're out in practice. Um, it's really important as to how your career progresses. So it's, it's not just about this year. It's not just about the next three years. It's really about the rest of your career as you practice pain medicine. Um, the other thing I'll say, you know, where, where is pain going? I think we're going to have to look more at our outcomes in terms of justifying, obviously, you know, access to care for our patients, um, both with payers and then patients want to know what are your personal outcomes with a given therapy? I think that's going to become a conversation. Um, I think it's also going to become a conversation with payers that we as physicians have to have. What are your outcomes with any, any procedure that we do? Um, so that they can justify, you know, where patients go, who they see, and what therapies they do access. Dr. Anna Nesqua, Dr. Moshe, any additional insight? It's, I mean, keep in mind that it's a journey. So you don't, you know, you finish your fellowship, you don't stop learning. So you're going to learn for the whole of your life. So, you know, when I started my fellowship, it was a quad, like four contact leads and only one company. And now we have how many? So, you know, it's um, it's ever evolving. You know, it's it's a very dynamic field. So be prepared for um, um, learning new things basically every year or every other year. So, you know, it's a journey. That's the, the whole thing you have to realize. It's not, it doesn't stop with your fellowship. It just starts there. 
experience. Um, so we're kind of getting around close to our last hour here. And so we'll, I know there's still some other questions, but um, we'll kind of end with one last question here. Dr. Mosher, perhaps you can start off with this question. Um, there are some people on the call that um, may not be going through the pinging application this cycle. And so the people are kind of wondering kind of about the ideal time to hit submit on the application. Like, is there an ideal time to hit submit? Is there a date that you consider too late to have submitted or that could be detrimental to your application? No, I think as long as you get it submitted um, by the when it closes, which um, some of you may correct me, is it May 1 um, or mid-April? Um, I think that waiting to have it complete is to your advantage. Make sure your letter, you know, obviously your letters that you want, you're asking your letter writers, give them, you know, a reasonable deadline. Um, and then getting your personal statement polished up and um, and whether you submit it, you know, in December or frankly, um, March, early March, for at least my program, we don't, we're not even pulling them till mid-March. So I don't know people that, you know, submitted, who submitted in December versus, you know, first week of March. Um, after that point, you know, I'll still pull if there's some coming in, um, you know, in early April, mid-April, but as you heard, it's uh, many people do rolling. Um, and so getting it in by maybe end of February, early March, maybe an advantage and others can comment. But um, for me, if you get it in by April 1, we batch them all together. So we'll move to Dr. Patel next. Yeah, I would say, you know, there's there are some people who, who don't discover pain until later um, in their residency. And you know, if you're applying, if your application comes in a little bit on the later side and you have a story about, you know, why maybe, maybe you were never exposed to interventional pain or pain medicine. And, and then you, you had an exposure and you're, you were convinced that this is what you want to do. Um, that that's, that's reasonable. So, you know, yeah, earlier is better, I would say, or, or mid session is better, but if there are late applications, don't be overly discouraged by that. Because if you are truly enthusiastic about entering pain medicine and you have a story as to when and why you were and how you were exposed to pain, it, 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 it has a lot of meaning. And so you shouldn't be discouraged. I'm going to throw something out there. I, I agree with everything that uh, Dr. Moshler and Dr. Patel said, especially for our program. But I will say there are some programs that have already interviewed some folks um, and some programs start interviewing in February. And so if you have the, if you know you're going to do pain and you have the opportunity to get your application together, I would submit it in December. I think it gives you a better shot. Um, but obviously late is better than never. And so I, I think that, you know, I think all of us would consider an applicant who got their application in now, but I do think that it does limit some opportunities because not every program director operates the same. One thing I might add is that, you know, um, sure, late is better than never, but the thing is that you actually have to picture to 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 um, uh, make taking into consideration the uh, letters of recommendation. So sometimes it takes the um, uh, letter writers some time to do. So if you apply late and if you request the letters late, you might not have a complete application. So no matter how long how how late you apply, make sure that the application is is complete. But I agree with um, everybody. It's just, you know, earlier the better, but, you know, submit if you're, if you just discovered pain all of a sudden, and then you want to do a, um, you know, a, uh, a career in pain medicine, just apply. Awesome. Well, I want to thank the panelists again, one last time for devoting their time and expertise to kind of helping us navigate this process. I found this information super helpful as we go through this pain application process and hopefully some of those in attendance tonight that are gonna be going through it now and also in the future and a lot of helpful pearls through this. So again, thank you so much for your time. And we'll close the webinar now. It was a pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Bye.